Now at nine, the Running Collective in Pittsburgh is helping the community start off the new year on the right foot. Plus, an organization in Joplin is teaching immigrants and refugees how to drive with a simulator. And... After keeping a low profile during the pandemic, the flu is back with a vengeance. I'm Jonathan Sari in Atlanta. I'll have details coming up. The four states most watched news starts now. This is KOEM News at 9 on Fox 14. I'm Elise Snowy. Joplin police say a man is in the hospital after being shot multiple times in the Bar District. It happened just after midnight last night near the intersection of 6 and Joplin Avenue. Authorities say the 25 year old victim was rushed to the hospital. At last check, he was in critical but stable condition. Police are still trying to identify a suspect. A middle school teacher was arrested Thursday for allegedly abusing female students for the past decade in Oklahoma. Multiple current and former students claim the PE teacher has been abusing them daily. Now they're coming forward seeking justice. Kylie Thomas has the story. Honestly, why nobody ever came to law enforcement, I, I don't know. Woodward Middle School teacher Benjamin Hall is accused of inappropriately touching his female students. The alleged abuse spans a decade, beginning his first year as a teacher in 2012. The PE and health teacher has now been charged with seven counts of lewd acts on a child. He was arrested Thursday at his home. We found victims going back to 2012, um, girls that had no way of knowing each other, um, that were telling very similar stories, very, giving very similar accounts. According to court documents, multiple current and former female students have come forward with the same story, claiming Hall would slap their buttocks with a ruler or meter stick, sometimes his hand. One 19-year-old woman claimed Hall did the same thing to her in eighth grade, telling her he just wanted to see how well it would bounce back. The students complained. Um, they didn't see anything coming of it, maybe. Uh, parents complained, didn't see anything coming of it. In the document, students said Hall would have a line of girls stretched in front of him in P.E. as he watched from behind, never letting them change out of their skirts or dresses. Hall was also the softball coach for a few seasons. One player claimed he cupped her breasts. Another player said he put his hand on her upper thigh. She said it made her so uncomfortable she quit even though it was her senior year. Now police are encouraging more victims to come forward. Because I really don't believe that we have found everybody. I just don't. Investigators say now that Hall is charged, they'll work with the district to see if any more investigation is needed. Benjamin Hall was able to post a $100,000 bond to get out of jail. His next court appearance will be Tuesday. Chloe Arroyo joins us with the first look at weather. Thanks, Elise. Heading into tonight, we're going to dip down into that freezing range. We're not there quite yet, but slowly but surely we'll reach there. Joplin 36, Neosho 35, as well as Nevada and Lamar Yates Center, you're at 36 degrees right now. Now we have two events coming up. First off, Tuesday, in terms of our snow meter, we could see some road impacts, but Friday, we're also tracking that could be a little bit more of an elevated risk. So we could see a couple of snow days here and there, especially for some further northern counties. Now coming up here in a bit, I have all the details, including the timeline on this system on Monday and Tuesday. Then we're going to dive deeper into the snow on Friday and we could see some triple digit temperatures in the forecast. I'll have all that and more coming up here in a bit. All right, thanks, Chloe. With the colder weather, it can be a perfect time to take on a new hobby or learn a new craft. Kathy Wagoner of Hooks and Loops Primitive Rug Hooking taught beginners in Kansas the essentials of rug hooking today at the Crawford County Historical Museum. The class included basic binding techniques, how to pull loops, and a little history on the primitive rugs. There's a traditional, which is uh, real shaded um, flowers, leaves, maybe an oriental type looking rug, and those where they use a lot of different shades of the same color and very small strips. These strips are wider, and just the chunky colors makes up the primitive patterns. Today's class was $65 per person, with some of the proceeds going toward a donation to the Crawford County Historical Museum. 
Well, some four staters today were able to kick off the new year on the right foot with a community run. Attendees were able to run or walk the two and three mile courses. The running collective hosts two runs every Wednesday and one Saturday run once a month. Officials say it's a great way to get in a workout while hanging out with friends. It connects people, um, so you can be any different pace and there's, it's a, a lot of sports are against other people, but running is a sport against yourself. Um, and so there's not, there is competitiveness in it, but it's a lot of good community. The run was open to all ages, abilities, and furry friends. A Joplin organization is offering le legal immigrants and refugees in the area to the opportunity to learn how to drive in a simulator. For this program, the Refugee and Immigrant Services and Education Raise was supported by the Joplin Interfaith Coalition. The money put toward the purchase of the equipment comes from the coalition's annual bake sale almost $10,000. According to Ray's, <laughs> knowing how to drive is essential in the area. The community is encouraged to get involved in supporting these immigrants in their transportation needs. Teaching somebody how to drive, uh, taking them to, to the grocery store, you know, transporting them to appointments. And, um, you know, we also need a lot of donations. You know, when these families come, um, we need to furnish their homes. We need help to set up the houses. Raises an official resettlement site through Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services. To learn other ways the nonprofit supports immigrants and refugees, go to our website, koamnewsnow.com. Coming up, doctors believe they have found a cause in a SIDS breakthrough. Sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, may now have at least one determined cause. Researchers at NYU Langone Medical Center say SIDS may actually be caused by seizure, seizures paired up with muscle spasms. The scientists studied 300 SIDS cases, records, and even video recordings for clues. The NYU team shared that low levels of a blood enzyme could also be a potential cause. But more research is needed to understand how both play a role in causing SIDS. Of the three viruses making up the so-called triple-demic flu is in the spotlight this week, causing more infections than COVID or RSV. Fox News senior correspondent Jonathan Sari has more from Atlanta. I would say right this moment, flu is causing more severe disease than COVID. Health officials across the country are scrambling to contain a new surge of respiratory viruses. And while COVID and RSV are on the radar, this year flu is causing the most infections. And the sheer numbers are also driving up the amount of serious cases. Flu is so dominant that there are more patients with influenza, milder infections that can go home, but also people that need hospitalization. You can see here on the CDC's latest flu tracker, most of the country is experiencing high activity. So far this season, we've seen more than 7 million illnesses, 73,000 hospitalizations, and 4,500 deaths. And that trend is expected to continue as folks return from their holiday gatherings. Another big driver, vaccine hesitancy, with less than half of the country rolling up their sleeves for the flu shot so far. People are definitely more resistant to get shots this year than they have been. I think we burned them out a little bit with the COVID shots. Now, some doctors and pharmacists are warning upcoming price hikes for hundreds of drugs could make it even harder to fight the flu. And they're urging patients to find a pharmacist they trust so they can get the treatment they need. The pharmacists and the pharmacy technicians are far more in tune with the prices of drugs. So work with a pharmacist, see what options are out there. There are a number of antiviral treatments available, but they're most effective if used early. So call your doctor right away if you're feeling sick. In Atlanta, Jonathan Seri, Fox News. Chloe is next with a complete look at the forecast. And later, the East Coast racing for its first winter storm of 2024. Well, a pretty active week in terms of snowfall, winter weather, cold temperatures, the whole nine yards heading into the next six or seven days or so. Here's a look at your Indigo Sky Casino and Resort just west of Seneca, Missouri, a clear parking lot. But my goodness, 
Is it chilly out there right now? We're hanging just a hair above freezing right now, so we'll take what we can get at this point. Joplin 36, Miami 39, Stockton, you're hanging around at 35 degrees. The Otisha and Independence, you're at 37, so we're slowly starting to dip down into that freezing range. As we head into Sunday, we'll warm up just a little bit more before we get another cold front getting into Monday. So here's a look at that. Speaking of, here's our first big weather maker. We'll see rainfall starting Monday mid morning to the afternoon hours into the evening. That'll slowly start to transition into snow. Now our newest models are predicting that the snow, the line between snow and rain is pushed up a little further north. So accumulation totals may be more likely in our further northern counties, but this is going to last until Tuesday morning into the afternoon hours and then Tuesday 7 p.m. we'll still see a little bit of that snow lingering here and there. Now for your potential in amount in terms of amounts that this could change thing into tomorrow we'll slowly start to adjust this here and there as we get closer to the day itself. This is what we're looking at right now up to an inch for northeastern Oklahoma around southeastern far southeastern Kansas and a couple of counties within southwestern Missouri. You guys could see anywhere from an inch to three inches a little further up north. You guys have the greatest chance of seeing more snowfall upwards of six to ten inches possible heading into our northern counties. Uh, this could change at any given moment, but as we head into next week, what makes Friday a little bit more bigger than Tuesday's snow event are these temperatures. Here's the cold blast that we're tracking right now. A large air mass pushing down from the north is going to really reach down to the southern central plains and that's going to cool us down quite a bit heading into Friday. Notice our temperatures already below freezing Friday afternoon. Then that snow, that rain and snow line is going to be a little further south. So in terms of accumulation, this looks a little more likely here Saturday morning that will continue to persist. Now, in terms of your snow meter Tuesday, you could see some road impacts. Snow days still kind of a little less likely than Friday, but we still could see in our further northern counties. Friday's a little bit more of even though it's further out, it's a little bit more of a trickier situation just because those temperatures are a whole lot colder. So not only do we have a snowfall, heavier snowfall with this, we could also see those colder temperatures, which could hold on to that accumulation a little bit more. So snow days could seem pretty likely for your weekend next weekend. Here's a look at your forecast, a mighty busy week ahead. We have a possible alert day on Tuesday. We'll see a little bit of a break on Wednesday and Thursday before we see that second round of snowfall coming into Friday. Notice the high only 30 degrees on Friday and unfortunately we might see some single digit temperatures for our lows. Snow days were always the best growing up. I'm sure kids in the area are crossing their fingers. Hoping, hoping. so, yes. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Chloe. Well, the East Coast hunkering down this weekend for its first major snowfall of 2024. Fox Weather's Brandy Campbell has that story. The new year bringing a new round of winter weather. The East Coast gearing up for what could be a very formidable nor'easter. The National Weather Service issuing winter storm warnings from the Carolinas up through Maine. Parts of New York State and New England could see as much as a foot of snow. Emergency crews spent the last few days chaining up their tires, salting the roadways. We spoke to a plow driver who's ready to get to work. Guys get excited. Everybody's been out doing their equipment the last week. Getting ready, hyped up, you know, hoping to make his paychecks. Maryland on Saturday getting one to two inches per hour. That was creating some messy conditions on the roadways. Three counties actually issuing snow emergencies, which meant only drivers with approved snow tires could be out on the roads. In New York City, it's been nearly two years since they've seen an inch of snow. Some are actually looking forward to getting a taste of real winter weather. It doesn't feel like winter until there's snow, so hopefully we'll have some snow on the ground. I would very much like that. The only other time that I've seen snow was on the Aspen Mountains in Colorado. Others, not so much. I just want to be able to get to work, and I want to be able to see my friends, so I don't know, I'd appreciate not too much. Now some of the heaviest snowfall is expected on Sunday. Officials warn to stay off the roads if you can. They plan to have everything cleaned up by the Monday morning commute. In Hagerstown, Maryland, I'm Brandi Campbell for Fox Weather. Coming up, more threats toward Israel. Hezbollah's leader issues a threat towards Israel as Israel's military forces ramp up operations in Gaza. In Tel Aviv, Israel, I'm Alex Hogan. I'll have more on this story coming up. 
hitting the road after plugging in for more than 800 miles in an electric vehicle. Fox Business correspondent Jeff Flock found that you better do your homework before your big drive. When it comes to electric vehicles, the technology is great and you can't beat the acceleration. But if you're planning to take one on a cross-country trip, there are some things you should think about. Chicago to New York in an EV. According to Tesla's routing, it should take 16 hours, compared to a gas car, which would be about 13 and a half. You're supposed to arrive in New York on Friday. You think you're going to make it on time? <laughs> Fingers crossed. Off we go. Our first charging stop, Elkhart, Indiana. We traveled 112 miles. The battery was supposed to take us 219. Backing up skills required, by the way, to access the rear port. <clears throat> A half hour later, we're back on the open road. Charging stop number two, Maumee, Ohio. According to the car, the battery should have taken us 205 miles, but we'd only gotten 127. We stopped for the night in Elyria, Ohio, not far from Cleveland. So last night when we parked the car, we had 38 miles remaining. This morning, didn't do anything overnight, 15 miles remaining. The Tesla software routed us to the nearest supercharger in Sheffield, Ohio. Oh, gosh, we could have gone another 15 feet. Stopping off in Girard, Ohio, for our second charge of the day. At this point, we've traveled 87 miles since our last charge. That's 46 miles less than anticipated. With the battery charged, we headed back to the highway. Three more stops to juice up the car, each time only getting between 58 and 69% of the mileage that the car had estimated. After two days and 808 miles of roads with next to no traffic, we reached New York City in just under 17 hours of driving, plus charging. About an hour longer than the car had estimated, but three and a half hours longer than a gas car would have taken. Uh, it was a good ride. If you stay on course, you'll be okay. If, however, you're like me and you like to, uh, well, be spontaneous out there on a road trip, you might be in for a long ride. With the Fox Business Network, I'm Jeff Flack. A new report shows a sharp rise in theft insurance claims for Hyundai and Kia vehicles. Data from the Highway Loss Data Institute says thefts the company's vehicles increased 1,000 percent between 2020 and the first half of 2023, while theft of other makes remained the same during this period. Older Kia and Hyundai models equipped with turnkey ignitions were reportedly the most vulnerable of being stolen as the spike in thefts came during a viral trend on social media. A popular chicken chain is taking a leap into the entertainment industry. Up next. Chick-fil-A is taking a leap into the entertainment industry. In November, the fast food chain released a short film right after announcing their winter menu. Not long after, the company posted a job listing for an entertainment producer role. The job posting details how the content produced will go on the company's soon-to-be-launched Play app. The new app will feature podcasts, original animation, reality, and game shows. As of right now, there is no set release date for the Play app. 30 more minutes of news, weather, and sports coming your way. Coming up, the Supreme Court now at taking center stage in the 2024 presidential election. While President Biden kicks off his campaign in Pennsylvania, Republicans are focusing their attention on Iowa, just ahead of the first in the nation caucuses. President Trump was scheduled to hold two rallies there on Friday. Fox News correspondent Mark Meredith takes a look. With 10 days to go until the Iowa caucus, former President Trump is barnstorming the state, determined to hold on to his frontrunner status and take on President Biden in November. Our country's going to hell. You don't mind me using that horrible word, don't you? I use that word because our country's really in trouble. Trump, who lost Iowa eight years ago, is also launching a set of new attack ads. The first, touting his economic record against his successor. Mortgage rates low under Trump. 
punishing under Biden. The second ad, a direct attack against the woman increasingly becoming his top Republican rival, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. Haley joined Biden in opposing Trump's visitor ban from terrorist nations. Today, Haley fired back, telling Fox the country cannot handle another four years of Trump. Isn't that sweet of him spending so much time and money against me? Tonight, Haley's campaign is also welcoming MAGA supporters who may be fed up with Trump. Retired General Don Bolduc among those now backing Haley. Look, I'm MAGA all the way. I've always been America first. But this time, I'm for Nikki Haley for president. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is stepping up his attacks against both Haley and Trump, telling voters Thursday Trump is parachuting into the state at the 11th hour. Has he gone to all 99 counties? Heck, has he even gone to nine counties? That's not the way to do it. But Trump's campaign says its ground game in Iowa is strong, insisting large crowds at rallies like the one tonight prove Trump has Iowa locked up. And while the Republican candidates say they want to talk about the issues that matter to voters, they are also talking about the impending criminal trials that Trump is facing, with Haley and DeSantis both vowing to pardon Trump if elected. In Washington, Mark Meredith, Fox News. The Supreme Court has agreed to decide whether former President Trump can be kept off the ballot because of his efforts to overturn his loss in the 2020 presidential election. The decision will put the court right in the middle of the 2024 presidential campaign. The justices acknowledge the need to reach a decision quickly since voters across the country will soon begin casting ballots in the primaries. The court agreed to take up Mr. Trump's appeal of a case from Colorado involving his role in the riots that took place three years ago. Arguments are scheduled for February 8th. Israel's offensive in Gaza is showing no signs of letting up as forces unleash strikes in urban areas. Yesterday, Israel released footage of airstrikes on what it says are Hamas's targets in the Gaza Strip. Fox News correspondent Alex Hogan has a story from Tel Aviv. Smoke rising over Gaza. The IDF says it hit 100 targets in the last day alone. And now the country's defense minister is breaking down his vision of what would follow the fight. Yoav Gallant says after the war, Palestinian leaders should control Gaza, but not Hamas, and that Israel should retain military freedom on the Strip. Also, Israel should inspect goods entering Gaza. As far as the widespread destruction, Gallant claims a multinational task force led by the U.S. and European partners should take responsibility for the rehabilitation of the Strip. No response from Washington on that. I just think it's too early for me to talk about that publicly. As U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken kicks off his tour in the region, State Department officials say this trip will focus on protecting civilians, lowering tensions in the West Bank, and preventing the escalation of this war, especially after developments over the past week. On Tuesday, an explosion in Beirut killed a top Hamas official. The Iran-backed group Hezbollah in Lebanon pinning it on an Israeli drone strike. After nearly two months without an address, today Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah spoke out for a second time this week, demanding action. When the targeting takes place in Lebanon, in southern Beirut, we cannot accept it. This is a large and dangerous breach. Blinken's trip will also center on how to immediately increase humanitarian assistance into the Strip and how to bring home the hostages, especially the Americans still held in Gaza. In Tel Aviv, Israel, Alex Hogan, Fox News. Still ahead, the climate change debate heats up. The fight against global warming just got a lot hotter. I'm Eben Brown in Miami. I'll have that story straight ahead. Well, it wouldn't be a winter day in the four states if we weren't tracking snowfall and cold temperatures. We're continuing to see such an active week ahead of us. Here's a look at our Indigo Sky Casino and Resort just west of Seneca, Missouri. Parking lots clear, nothing going on in terms of precipitation. A couple folks a little further north saw some snow showers here and there this evening, but since then we've cleared out completely. Temperatures mid to upper 30s right now. Miami 36, Joplin, or excuse me, Miami 39, Joplin 36. Got them backwards. Lameda, Lamar at 35 as well as Stockton. Yates Center, you're hanging around at 36 degrees right now. So we're slowly starting to dip down into that freezing range. We're a little warmer than what we will be heading into next week. But in the meantime, let's talk about Monday and Tuesday. Starting Monday around 11 a.m., we'll start to see that rainfall enter into the picture. 
And then that rain will eventually transition into snow. Now, our models have shown that our line between rain and snow has pushed a little further up north, which will make your snowfall accumulations for folks in northeastern Oklahoma and northwestern Arkansas a little less significant than what we were seeing beforehand. But this is a look for Tuesday, 7 a.m. This is going to continue to push off to the east. And then eventually all of us will see that snowfall starting Tuesday around noon and that will continue throughout the afternoon and eventually the evening hours will start to uh, taper off in terms of accumulation. Here's a look at our potential snowfall that we could be seeing uh, up to an inch for northeastern Oklahoma, northwestern Arkansas. And notice how this is all shifted up a little further north so you can see up to six to ten inches for our farther northern counties. And then anywhere from three to six inches around the Chinook, Nevada area. Now, like I said, this could, this is just a projection and we're pretty far out. So as we head into Sunday and Monday, we'll get a little bit more of an accurate representation of that. But one thing we do know for sure is that next week we're going to see some colder temperatures. We have a cold Arctic air mass coming from the north, pushing down into the southern central plains a little bit earlier than expected. Temperatures could reach down into single digits by next weekend, which will really support all of the precipitation that we'll see Friday. Notice that line between rain and snowfall is pushed a little further south because those temperatures well below freezing Joplin 26. This is Friday at 8 p.m. So this will start in the afternoon hours, extend into the evening and even into Saturday morning. This is Saturday at midnight, so we'll start to see that in the early morning hours of Saturday morning as that will push off by the afternoon. Tuesday, we have some road impacts possible. A couple of people could see some snow days, but I see that a little more likely for Friday into the evening hours throughout the weekend. So make sure you're being prepared for that as well as the cold temperatures and bundle up as you get into the rest of next week. Here's a look at your seven day forecast. My goodness, a very busy week ahead of us in terms of weather. We have a possible alert day on Tuesday. We'll see a break on Wednesday and Thursday. Temperatures in the 40s, but then Friday. Look at that high and look at that snowfall. 60% chance by the end of next week. I think I'm going to call it a weather roller coaster <laughs> for is. the next week. High yeah. highs, low lows. All right. Thanks, Chloe. Of course. Well, coming up in sports, we break down the final results of the Kaminsky Classic Tournament in Joplin. Plus, Missouri Southern men's and women's basketball travels to Pitt State for a rivalry game. Brock Baldridge has the highlights and more up next. Well, one of the most anticipated MIAA women's basketball matchups of the season takes place this weekend between both of our local schools, and both teams are on a five-game winning streak, so whichever team wins, well, that streak will end. Missouri Southern is on the road for their fourth straight game. The Lions looking to pull off the upset against the rival Pitt State. So in the first quarter, Reese Webb misses a three-point shot here, but picks up her own rebound to score the layup. Lions lead by three points early on. Later in the first half, Pitt State gets the ball to their playmaker, Grace Pyle, and she hits the mid-range jumper here. Pitt State went into halftime trailing by five points. We head to the second half. Gorillas drop a play to Pyle again, and she splashes a three-pointer. She led Pitt State with 18 points today. But Missouri Southern had other answers. In the third quarter, Reese Webb open at the top of the key, and she knocks it down. A few possessions later, it's Reese Webb who's open again in the corner. She stays hot. 15 points this afternoon for the Murray State transfer, Reese Webb. Then in the final seconds of the third quarter, Chrislyn Jones has to put it up and she beats the buzzer in desperation at the end of the quarter. Missouri Southern wins their sixth straight game. Third road win against a top 20 team this season. Lions upset the Gorillas 71 to 65. Uh, you know, it took us a little bit to kind of mesh a little bit because we had so many new kids, uh, but they're starting to mesh and, and doing a great job of playing with each other uh, and for each other. So that's the exciting thing about this team. I feel as though we started off not together as a team, but, you know, we got in, we locked in, and now we're knocking them off one by one. Just after the women's game, the Pitt State men host their rivals Missouri Southern on their home floor. In the opening minutes of the game, Avery Taggart, who gets the steal here, tosses it over to Parker Long. He goes the other way, coast to coast, to get the bucket in transition. Lions lead by four early on. The Pitt State, well, they have an answer, and that's Max Alexander, who gets the bucket on the mid-range jumper. He finished with 17 points. 
Later in the first half, Alexander finds Tanner Manns. It's a big three-point shot there in the corner. Gorillas looking to get back in the game. They trail by seven. Closing minutes of the first half, Darius Dawson. How about him today? It's open for the three here. He is money. Then Dawson drives to the rim, gets fouled. He had 21 points in the first half for the Lions. Southern leads by one going into halftime. Then Marquis English gets the bucket for Pitt State to open up the second half. But Southern, well, they just kept that momentum rolling in this game. Sam Thompson answers with a two-hand slam off the pick and roll. Missouri Southern goes on the road to beat Pitt State 81-74. The Lions have now won three of their last four games. Well, today is the third and final day of the Kamitsi Classic at Joplin High School. All four of our local teams are in the consolation bracket, looking to bring home a win before the conference season begins. In the fifth place game this afternoon, it's a rivalry game between Webb City and Joplin. The Eagles keep this one close, but it's Webb City who comes away with the victory. Cardinals win it 58-50. Both teams are scheduled to meet again on February the 13th. Earlier this morning, it was the seventh place game between Neosho and Carl Junction. CJ bounces back after their loss to Webb City yesterday to win this game over Neosho 58-37. Over to Division I men's college basketball. Kansas opens up Big 12 play at home versus TCU. In the second half, Hunter Dickinson gets the dunk here. Jayhawks lead by one. Under five minutes to go, the Horn Frogs are sticking around this game. Travion Tennyson knocks down a huge three to give TCU the lead by two. Under a minute left, Jayhawks lead by two. Michael Peavy gets the putback off the miss, and we are tied up 77 apiece. Bill Self can't believe it. We're not supposed to be tied to Allen Fieldhouse this late in the game. Ten seconds left in the game. Biggest play here. Just give the ball to your biggest player. Hunter Dickinson gets the clutch basket. Jayhawks lead by two. Final possession of the game. TCU gives themselves a chance here. Desperation for TCU is no good. Jayhawks survive. They win this one 83-81. to over to the SEC, the Arkansas Razorbacks open up SEC play at home against the 25th ranked Auburn Tigers. The Hogs really need to pick up some wins to boost their resume for the NCAA tournament. It was a rough run today in Fayetteville. Tigers beat the Razorbacks 83 to 51. Well, let's look for sports. We'll be back with more news right after this. As the fight against global warming heats up, some critics of government mandates say innovation, not regulation, is the right way to build a green economy. Fox's Evan Brown has more in this edition of our Fox on Tech series. Net zero it can be attainable, but it needs to be balanced with the trade-offs that we're willing to make. At the UN Climate Conference last month, more than 190 countries approved a historic agreement that will move the world away from the use of fossil fuels. But critics say it is a move in the wrong direction, and government mandates to lower emissions are a short-term fix at best. C3 Solutions is a pro-climate conservative coalition. Their new report makes the case that free economies equal clean economies. If you have a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship, that leads to investment in all types of environmentally friendly technologies that consumers actually want. And green technology is a big part of that. Their report highlights the link between economic freedom and higher standards of sanitation, pollution control, and clean air. And investment in technology is essential for developing sustainable energy solutions. That could be wind, solar, but it could also be uh, small modular reactors. I think natural gas is a, a critical part of the solution. There's a lot of opportunity there. In other words, C3 claims we can reduce carbon emissions without reducing fossil fuels if the focus remains on innovation and not regulation. I'm encouraged by the, the amount of innovation that we've seen in the energy space, the clean energy space, in uh, different types of environmental solutions. The worldwide renewable energy market was worth about a trillion dollars last year. They expect that to double by 2030. In Miami, Evan Brown, Fox News. Up next, we'll take a look ahead at some new music in 2024. The first three months of the new year will be rocking with new albums. Rick Damagella runs down the releases in the Hollywood Minute. The American dream is killing me. The American dream is killing me. When it's all double talk of conspiracy. Green Day kick off 2024 with their 14th studio album, Saviors, featuring the single The American Dream is Killing Me on January 19th.
January 26 sees Orange County, California's Ty Siegel releasing his new album, Three Bells, featuring the song My Room. You see the difference when it's done. Connecticut duo MGMT are slated to release their new album, Loss of Life, with this song, Mother Nature, on February 23rd. Heavy metal legends Judas Priest will unleash their latest album, Invincible Shield, featuring the song Trial by Fire, on March 8th. Lenny Kravitz is releasing his first new studio album in six years. Blue Electric Light arrives March 15th and includes the single TK421. Rocking out in Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. That's our time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll leave you with a video of a new baby western lowland gorilla at the Prague Zoo. We'll see you back here next time. Thanks for making us part of your night.